She's 13 and she's a singer-songwriter. And after the TED Talk, she said, Dad, have you ever given a TED Talk? I said, no. So Bella, I'm, I'm at Big Omaha, all right? Woo! Beat this, game on. That being said, I'm not really sure why I'm here. I'm not your typical entrepreneur. I mean, first of all, look at me. This is my real hair color. I'm old. Second, I'm a doctor. And we're really bad business people in general. Um, and third, even though I run a healthcare company that has 50 million users every, uh, every year using our technology and works with a lot of the healthcare system, I didn't create it with a vision. I didn't create it with an idea that I had that just spontaneously came out. I didn't levitate from my bed one day and have that idea. And I'm not a technology guy, really. I'm not a digital native. I'm not a software developer. We created a iTriage because we were passionate about fixing a big healthcare problem. And that is really the thing that is behind, you know, everything that we're doing with this company. And technology was the way to get it done. I love iTriage. I love working there. I'm passionate about it. And I could talk about it for five hours. So I, I'll meet you guys outside later. <clears throat> but if I were to just talk about iTriage and not talk about some of the personal life experiences that I had that led to creating it, it would really be irresponsible. And so I'm going to I'm going to talk to you about the story of getting to the Big Omaha stage and some of the experiences I had through life that led me to want to solve a big problem in healthcare. I'm going to go way back, almost a cathartic journey. Hopefully, it won't be like that boring uncle at Thanksgiving that corners you. Is that the there's a tornado? <laughs> All right, now I'm in stereo. So my thesis today is that if you experience life and you live it to the fullest and you do things um, that you're interested in, some, you're, you're going to have experiences that lead you to see big problems, problems that really matter, and problems that then you might become passionate about fixing. And in doing that, that's a, another pathway to becoming an entrepreneur. That was my pathway. I had no idea I was going to do this when I was, when I was growing up. And so um, think about that. And I'm going to give you, I'm going to talk a little bit, before I talk about iTriage, about some of the experiences I had and the things that were formative for me, uh, thinking about taking on a big problem. This is Wayne, and uh, my partner in iTriage, and it's 11 o'clock at night, and we're smiling because I think this is our last day in the ER. <laughs> we're trying to hand it over to somebody uh, to take over. So I'm going to start by going back to when I was about 10 years old. Does, I had forgotten the word Weeblo. <laughs> but Weeblo. Uh, was a, a, a early Boy Scout, and um, at 10 years old, uh, I learned something about myself that you know, I hadn't known before. I, I learned that I had a trait to deal with chaos and something going on that, that was really uh, startling, crazy, emotional, and be rational about it. One day, I was uh, sitting in my living room. Uh, I was doing homework. My dad, uh, who was a college professor, had come home and uh, was grading papers, and it was just like a, any other normal night. I grew up in Wisconsin. And uh, I, I'll never forget the image. I looked over, and I saw him kind of stop. His face started contorting. 
started breathing heavily. And then he went into what we've all seen on TV as a grand mal seizure. His body started rhythmically uh, moving. He was thrashing around. He was unconscious. His eyes rolled back in his head. And the whole family freaked out and started screaming. And for some reason, I don't know why, I stood there and I walked over to him. I grabbed him, helped him to the ground, turned him on his side so he wouldn't choke, and kept him from hurting himself, thrashing around, and, and turned to somebody and said, please call 911. There was 911 back then, but it was a rotary phone. And, and so, at that point in time, I learned that for some reason I had the ability to deal with situations when the shit is hitting the fan and think rationally. And, and at that point in time, I thought, well, maybe medicine's a good field to go into. And certainly that is a trait that you want in your doctor, if you don't already realize that, especially when you go to the emergency room. And so I would become an emergency physician later in life and, uh, and certainly uh, employed that, that skill and quality. At the same time, I was kind of a creative, imaginative kid, and I loved to, uh, to build things. Um, so I would build go-karts, and I'd do science experiments. And really, I believe that invention could somehow transcend the boundaries of the world. That through invention, you could be a superhero. I'm going to tell you kind of an embarrassing story. There was a school near our house, and we'd go play on the playground. The kids would climb to the top of the jungle gym. And there was also this really big fence behind home plate that was like two stories tall, and I, I thought, I want to climb that. And so I invented what is the first ever fence climbing arm hook device, which uh, is not a good idea. Do not do this. <laughs> it had handles that attached to your arms, and you could climb this thing and I climbed up and went over it and felt pretty cool. This was before base jumping and the things that kids these days do. <laughs> and um, I realized that that was kind of illustrative of my approach to life. That I, I don't like to be corralled by fences. I'm sure some of you don't either. I don't want to try to break through them like I have to escape something. I want to climb over them. And technology and business and innovation can help people climb over fences. A couple years later, I think I was 13, my parents had the great idea of creating an immersive experience for us by taking us to Guatemala to live. My dad at this time, he was fine from that previous incident, just not enough sleep, not eating normally. Um, what, got a Fulbright scholarship to study vitamin A and how to take vitamin A and put it into infant formulas and help people uh, or help kids um, uh, see better and not have vitamin A deficient blindness. It was a great experience. I got to see things that I still remember to this day. Extreme poverty. We'd see amputees living in the street fending for themselves. I even went to school at an all-Spanish school called La Salle. I'll never forget my first day. It was a little bit scarier than this right now. <laughs> I walk in, it's all in Spanish, I speak nothing. The teacher says, come on up here. And he hands me a note of paper that's in English, it's written, sing the national anthem. So um, I learned a lot. <laughs> About, um, about confidence. Um, but I also learned how to dream in Spanish, think crazy Spanish soap opera from a teenager's perspective. And I saw things that just didn't seem right, that weren't what we experienced in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Things that made me want to think about how to make changes, how to make things better. And so, um, you know, what is a kid who has the ability to think rationally in times of chaos, someone who's seen, you know, the world and the problems that the world, um, that the world has, um, or the third world countries, you know, demonstrate so vividly, and loves to create stuff? Um, what do they do? Well, I went off to college, uh, Colorado College, and I studied 
everything that didn't lead me to medicine. I really was trying not to pick this vertical. I studied Russian literature. I ended up being a poli-sci major. In fact, Latin American poli-sci, which is essentially the study of dictators. <clears throat> that is a major. And that led to a year off. <laughs> Um, and so I took a year off and I, I uh, was a raft guide and a ski coach and I did all sorts of things. I, I was a tree trimmer. It's pretty fun actually, sitting up in a tree with a chainsaw. Um, and, and I basically dreamed and I thought, what do I want to do? What do I want to create? Who do I want to be? And so the medicine thing kind of caught up with me and I realized that if you do just your hobbies for your job, sometimes they start to feel like work. And that if you want to do something and feel like you've accomplished something in your life, take on a big challenge, do something meaningful. And so I went into medicine. And I spent three years, the first three years, in a lot of lectures. I slogged through it. I played a lot of pool and snuck out of class. And uh, after that third year, I, I figured out something. I could take all my electives and I could bundle them all together and get about four or five months off. So I went around the world uh, during that time. And um, it was a crazy experience because I got, to, I got to see what medicine was like you know, in different parts of the world and in different cultures and different languages. And so a couple stories from that. I worked at this hospital in Kikuyu, Kenya, where the guards of the hospital were Maasai warriors. And they actually dressed like this, and, and the guys that we had had spears because they were protecting the hospital from lions. And call at that hospital, and now remember I'm a med student, I'm taking call, so that's a little scary. Um, but the call was that the Maasai warrior would come to your window and would bang on the window with a spear, and you'd jump out of bed and open the window, and they'd hand you a note. And the note would always say, doctor, Come quick. <laughs> Patient is gasping. You don't need to know much about medicine to know that gasping is not good. Um, and it never was good. And so a couple uh, patients I saw, one was a woman who had just given birth and she was bleeding to death from an antiquated birthing practice. I'd never diagnosed a uterine rupture before. We don't have them in the United States, typically. Very uncommon. So I did an exam, and then I had to figure out how to get the OBGYN and the operating room in. And the only way to summon them at night was through a bell on the top of the hospital. So it's like, go ring the bell, get them in. And um, she lived. Um, we did surgery, and she was saved by the med student, the spear, and the bell. Another woman that I tended to was a elderly Kenyan woman who um, was suffering a, a fatal stroke. And after I did everything that I could, she, and she didn't make it, I went and told the family. And they grabbed me, and they pulled me outside. I thought, here it goes, I'm going to die in Kenya. I've really messed up. Instead, they took my hands, and they looked up at the heavens and started praying and included me in their celebration of the end of life. Another case I saw um, was a two-year-old uh, girl that was playing with a dried bean seed. Again, not a good idea. And she uh, ingested it and choked. And I remember going into her room with that story, and she was sitting there playing normally. And um, all of a sudden, she'd stop breathing and turn blue right in front of my eyes. And I had to pick her up, turn her upside down, slap her on the back, and she started breathing again. But the bean seed never came out. So it just kept happening over and over again. And the parents didn't know that we couldn't treat that there. We had to bring her to Nairobi. So we loaded her up in a Land Rover and uh, you know, drove on the other side of the road as fast as we could and got her to the hospital and took care of her. And um, you know, some of these experiences um, started to sink in and I realized that you know medicine may be practiced differently around the world but we all have the same needs we need the information 
to make better decisions. We need the access to get health care. And, and th those are foundational, and they're really a common denominator around the world. It was crazy, but I would go to crazier things. Um, this guy's friends took the phrase, don't stab me in the back, in the wrong way, and took it literally. I, I went to Oakland and I did emergency medicine training in the early 90s, Bloods and Crips, Knife and Gun Club, early HIV with organ failure, and all sorts of problems. I saw that a lot of the things I'd seen around the world were similar in the US. People didn't know their meds, they didn't know their conditions, they didn't know how to take care of themselves. They didn't have the information, and they didn't know when, where, and how to access healthcare. It was really, really eye-opening. And it was a great training ground. But it was also the place where, for me, a couple experiences started to come together. In Kenya, I had played with this ultrasound machine that they you know, had gotten donated from another country. And so I learned a little bit about it. And so at, at the hospital in Oakland, we went to the radiology department one day, waited till they all left, and then stole an ultrasound machine. <laughs> and then we, we had the idea, let's start using it at the bedside and see what happens. So it doesn't harm you, it's not like x-ray. But you can look beyond the skin of somebody and see inside. And so think about all the different things you could do. We looked at hearts, and we could see if the heart was beating when we gave medicine for resuscitation. Or when we were trying to put central lines into the big veins coming out of the heart and down in the arms and, and groin, we could use the ultrasound machine to find that vein and to, almost like a video game, put it in. And it reduced complications and uh, it, it helped outcomes. For me, I was pretty excited because now there's some creativity mixing with medicine. Probably the most formative experience for me, though, was personal. My, um, uh, I came home from the ER one day, and my wife, who had just given birth to our first daughter, um, didn't look well. She was breathing, and she was having trouble breathing. Um, she felt really sick, and so I loaded the family back up and took, went back to the ER, now as a caregiver. When I got there, her oxygen level was in the low 80s, she wasn't breathing well, and the doctors took an x-ray and she had pneumonia in multiple places in her lung, a rare kind. And uh, the doctors took me aside and said, this could be fatal. And so I went from going, you know, doing an ER shift to coming home and all of a sudden I'm, I'm the, the husband, right? And, and, I mean, I thought, this, you know, this is fine, I, I know medicine, I'm gonna be okay in this situation. They admitted her to the ICU. The sicker she got, the more doctors came. It was hard to keep track of their names. It was hard to keep track of the medicines. I had no information. I had no access. This is early 2000s. There was no Wi-Fi in the hospital. And despite being part of the, the medical system, I felt like I was on the outside of the tent. I had to bribe the nurses to give me access to their computers and get information. Um, and uh, it was really, really frustrating. I started to feel what patients feel like when they're in the same situation. I wanted to climb over that fence. And I didn't know how. I would see the same look on my patient's eyes for the next 10 years practicing medicine. Fear, frustration, confusion. I knew that that was a core problem that I wanted to fix, but I didn't know how to fix it. I saw it from a lot of different angles, from overseas, from being a 10-year-old kid the first time, to a husband. I, don't, I didn't know how to fix it, but I kept perseverating about it and thinking about it until one day I had an idea. And I came up with this phrase, this is the one thing I think every entrepreneur should should feel before they start a company. You can't not do it. You have to do it. You perseverate about it. You think about it all the time. It's really important. It keeps you going at 2 a.m. or when you have $1,000 in the bank and payroll to make. 
And what I thought was, if we could get the information that I had in my head and, and put it somewhere that patients could use, that you could disrupt the system. You could get them the information they needed to make better decisions, to understand what the hell you're talking about when you talk to them, to access health care in an appropriate manner, you could disrupt the system. And at the same time, the iPhone came out. And I was addicted to it, and I knew my kids would be addicted to it, and all of us would be addicted to it, because it just made sense. It connected you to information, it was easy to use, simple to navigate, and the two ideas came together. Disrupt healthcare by giving information to patients, and use mobile devices, and then whatever else we carry around with us at all times. If the next thing is the me mechanical parrot that talks to you, iTriage needs to have a mechanical parrot version. Now, 2008, 2009, as we heard from uh, Tony earlier, it wasn't the, the greatest time for our economy. We started iTriage in late 2008, and we raised money in 2009. And I learned at that time that it's always a good time to raise money if you have a great idea and people believe you know how to solve it. So we raised money in January of 2009. In two weeks, we raised half a million dollars from friends and family. And um, you know they were scared to invest in the stock market because it was going that direction. And um, making an investment in what we were doing made a lot of sense. At the time, I cut my ER shifts way down, and I was all in. My wife, who's an artist, supported our family to make it through. And luckily, she's really good. And so Wayne and I, um, my co-founder, um, who's another ER doc, we sat down and we traced an iPhone and then we Xeroxed a bunch of copies and we started with user interface and user experience. Because we assumed that if you couldn't make it easy enough and navigatable enough for, for patients to use, it just wouldn't work. And all the data behind it and all the business opportunities behind it wouldn't matter. And so that's what we did. And then we focused on two core things. First was a series of questions that we had seen over and over again from Kenya to Oakland to our own practices in Denver, Colorado. What could I have and where should I go? Information and access. And if you think about how complex those are and, and the kind of problems that those create when they're not done appropriately, it creates massive problems, it creates bad outcomes, it creates the 70 year old that goes to the urgent care with chest pain to save money and has a heart attack. And it keeps the uh, um, non-urgent patient with a minor ankle, ankle sprain from getting charged $1,000 in the ER. The other thing that we did was we assumed that human nature would find a way, that if you could actually create transparency and information to the consumer, you build a marketplace. And there, there isn't a marketplace in healthcare. There is one, but there isn't. There isn't because you don't know the information, and you don't know the cost, and you don't know really how to navigate it. So we bet on human nature. And um, marketplaces, um, I believe, will solve a lot of the issues we're facing in healthcare. And as you know, healthcare traditionally has been kind of a lopsided exchange. We practice medicine generally paternalistically. We tell you what you have and we tell you what to do. And then you become dependent on us and you stop thinking. You don't know how to think and you don't have the information. And this has caused problems throughout history. And so, you know, that, that again was what we were trying to disrupt. Um, so we started our company, iTriage. We look really happy right here. This is our first article, but it wasn't easy. We launched in March of 2009 and uh, to a massive audience of 50 people, most of whom were our friends and family and investors. The next day we had 35.
And uh, it, it, it wasn't easy. Um, we knew that we couldn't disrupt healthcare if we only had 50 people coming in every day to download our technology. So we started to invest in PR and marketing. And we hired a firm and we went to New York and DC and we got some articles and we get a peak of 1,000 downloads and then it'd go down to 50. So it really wasn't gonna work. And, and so we just started focusing on the product and the company and we figured that we had to grow in a rational way. This was lean before lean was like this cool word. We were lean because we were done if we weren't lean. And so we had two people, then we had 12. We started Android, we started mobile web. We listened to our users and we started a habit that we, that we continue uh, today. We read every single review that comes in. And I personally have read 80,000 reviews on iTriage because that is what really matters. And we started making the product better and better and we pragmatically grew. Every um, fundraise, we would only sell 20% of our company. And we would only take 10 months of money. And we figured if we can't double the value of our company in 10 months, then we shouldn't be in business. And we kept doing that. And we started to work as a team with the, the, the people that we did hire. Now we also understood a really important thing, that healthcare has a lot of embedded parties in it. Big provider systems, big payers. Um, it's an entrenched, massive um, industry. And if we didn't figure out that there was alignment for what we wanted to do with payers and providers and other parts of the healthcare system, and everyone could do a big group hug like this about our technology, it wouldn't work. Somebody would hate it and they'd kill it. And so we started thinking about it. If patients had more information could find the right care, then providers who gave great care could get those patients. And payers who are looking for patients to make responsible decisions about access, accessing health care would start to save money. And patients who have, you know, own the outcome of their treatment are obviously invested, but also are now more and more financially at risk. So it all started to make sense. We started a network and we got people interested and hospitals to start participating. And, and one day we saw a billboard of iTriage from a hospital. We didn't pay for it, the hospital paid for it, and we knew we had started getting there. Now this is a massive undertaking, but it's a massive problem right now. We waste 750 billion, with a B, dollars a year in the healthcare system. Unnecessary services, things that we were addressing with our technology. And for those of us that uh, want the U.S. to be in a stable, strong financial position, we have to fix this. And we firmly believe that if patients become more engaged in their care, we have a chance. If they don't, we won't. And so we kept building and building and building and adding more and more to our product, but keeping the interface simple enough so that people would use it. Product got better, payers started to notice us, providers started to notice us, and, um, and we started to grow as a company. About that time, enter the U.S. government. They control about 50% of every dollar spent. And there's a pro program that I, I think somebody's talked, I think Anish Chopra's been here and talked about, uh, was the Health Data Initiative, Open Government Data. We were referred to Todd Park here, uh, the, now the, the U.S. CTO, about this program. And we started using data that came from the government in our product. So imagine you're working at the federal government, you curate this data all day long and then go home. And then one day you open it up and a product that's used by millions of people starts to make that data actionable and people find better care and more efficient care because of it. People got really jazzed and excited and it's been one of the best initiatives that we've taken on. And we started focusing more on culture, talent, and being a mission-driven company like we are, if people are looking at one company that does not have a mission or is just building cool technology and one that has a mission and cool technology, they generally pick mission. 
and it's allowed us to add an amazingly talented group of people to our team and has, has kept the company growing and growing. Every now and then you get some external validation that you never expected. So if you're running a company and you're thinking about your next year and you look at your budget and the money you have in the bank, you have to think that something's going to happen that you aren't aware of and it might be good. For us, this was a great event. I came into the office and I got a phone call from the White House. Michelle Obama has invited you to join her in the State of the Union this year. This is last February. And uh, so I went to, uh, the, I went to uh, Washington, D.C. And that's me in the upper left-hand corner there with the golf clap. <clears throat> it was a great experience. Uh, reception at the White House, police motorcade, Capitol building, pictures with the President and the First Lady. And I tried to steal Tim Cook's seat right behind Michelle, but they kicked me out and made me sit next to the 105-year-old lady from Miami. <clears throat> I guess I am still a doctor, so it was probably smart. <laughs> In 2011, when we had gotten to about two, uh, two million downloads <clears throat> and uh, I had a lot of provider clients, uh, we got a call from Aetna, one of the biggest um, healthcare insurance companies in the country. They were interested in what we were doing and wanted to acquire our company. It was a great, great call to get. Um, <clears throat> and uh, what was interesting is that while we had a vision of trying to help the healthcare system by engaging the consumer and disrupting the way that information and access flowed, so did Aetna. They believed in what we believed, and so we accepted their offer. And I'll never forget, <clears throat> the first day of diligence, 47 people signed into the diligence room. And I thought, oh my god, is this going to be the matrix? Um, Emily, my uh, director of finance, and myself fielded all their questions. Um, and we had set up a diligence room in the very beginning of our company so that we had every document there, and it worked really well. It's, a, it's something that I would recommend everybody do um, if they start a company. And what we found was like through this process that actually Aetna believed a lot of the stuff that we wanted to believe, and they really firmly believe that. And, and we asked for a couple things, autonomy to grow, capital to support us, as well as um, a shared vision. And it ended up feeling a lot more like a bunch of superheroes coming together to work. And uh, you know, think about being an autonomous, independently run innovation, um, innova innovation led company within a Fortune 50. Um, and so that's what we have today and it's working really, really well. So we got to uh, you know, 2 million downloads and 5 million downloads and now 9 million downloads and we started to grow our team and our culture and what I found is that the road never ends. And if you're a mission driven company, again we got, we, we, we went down this pathway because of experiences that we had, experiences that led to a realization of a big problem and then we got really passionate about solving that big problem. That's our mission. That's how we work. That doesn't change when you sell to another company. It doesn't change when you're working within another framework. And certainly transitioning the company for us was really, really important um, because you know, your resume is not a static piece of paper. It's really more like a Facebook profile. And our employees are very invested in following our mission and we continue to do so. And, and through the transition, we've lost nobody because of it. So it's been really remarkable. One of the other factors to success was my partner Wayne. My wife uh, calls him my business spouse because we communicate probably more than my wife and I at times. But she says, like her, he's better looking and wears better clothes. Um, but the real reason Wayne is a great partner is because um, whenever I have trouble being objective about something, I defer to him. He does the same. And I also know, having worked with him at night shifts in the ER, he's never going to drop something. And um, it's worked really well for us. And he knows the same about me. So as you, um, as you pursue your own entrepreneurial journeys, be open to the fact that they may come from your own experiences. 
that they may come from things that have brought you to realize a really big problem that you want to solve, a really tall fence to climb that you want to get over. And um, listen to those things, experience life, live, and whatever you do, become passionate about what you are directed uh, to solve. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I think we're, we're probably out of time for questions. Um, one question? All right. We're live, but we have time for uh, maybe two questions. And we'll start right here. Hi. Um, very interesting talk. I'm just wondering, I heard a story on NPR that all the hospitals released, or no, the government released data on hospitals and all what they charge for all the, the most hundred common procedures. Will you incorporate that data into your, your, new, your, your app? Yeah, great question. Yeah. So, um, pricing, so while transparency is real important, pricing and quality are really hard to measure in healthcare because pricing depends on your contract with that hospital, it depends on the procedure you have and the codes that um, you submit to get paid for that procedure. So those are, um, we already do have referential pricing in the app for a lot of procedures and we have pricing on uh, different levels of acute care as well and, and we'll be including more and more information over time. I think it's it's really easy to be skeptical about health insurance companies, especially the large ones. We know what's happened with healthcare spending in the past 20 years. What what can you say about the incentives for a company like Aetna to really have the same mission and vision that you do when it could affect their revenue? It, it should affect their revenue. It should decrease, essentially, to bring the cost curve down to in increase access. So what incentive do they have to do that? Well, interestingly, I think the incentive is that the system's broken. It can't continue. So these businesses will will have to change and evolve over time. You know, I think one of the things that has inspired me is Mark Bertolini, the CEO of Aetna, has been a patient. He's been a caregiver to his son, and he also runs a very large insurance company. And he has the perspective of a lot of the experiences that I learned you know, through my life. And he's very, very committed to this. So, you know, it starts with leadership, and then it has to make sense every step of the way, but at some point you just have to take that jump and, uh, and start to work directly with providers like we're doing with ACOs. And you have to have technology that you provide free to consumers like iTriage to, to try to disrupt and engage patients in a different way. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Dr. Peter Hudson. Thank you. Thank you.